So welcome everyone. Uh, we are Friday. This is the fifth day of our workshop on optimization under uncertainty. It's a real pleasure to have all of you. And it's also a, more of a real pleasure to introduce you Céline Damla Hayipasaoglu. Sorry, Céline, first yeah. time I tried to pronounce your last name. She's associate professor in the mathematical science department in the University of Southampton. Uh, prior to that, she has been a visiting faculty member in the uh, National University of Singapore. She also has uh, occupied the position of assistant professor at Singapore University of Technology and Design. Uh, she's been interested uh, in convex optimization and statistical learning, uh, yet focuses on robust optimization and its application in discrete choice modeling, portfolio optimization and transportation. Celine, it's a real pleasure to have you with us today. Thanks for accepting uh, our, our invitation to present. Uh, I look forward to uh, hearing about your, your work and the discussion that might ensue. Follow up. Thank you very much, uh, Eric, uh, Walter, and Fabian uh, for the invitation. Uh, I must say that I really had a great time listening to talks, and I, I had to miss some of them because they were later, but I did uh, catch up with them. So thank you very much for making them available. I think especially the tutorials will be a very good resource for our PhD students because we're not able to offer courses in these uh, topics. Uh, you know, every term. And I'm very excited to know that they exist there and uh, they're there. And I have an opportunity to see the other talks in the CRM website as well. It's a, certainly a very valuable resource. So today I will be talking about uh, assortment optimization, uh, especially for data sets where we may observe heuristic elasticity. And you're going to see that this is related to DRO in the, the sense that we're going to be looking at some models where the distributions of the um, Sorting of utility functions are not fully uh, defined. So uh, let's just take a look at the um, outline. So I'm going to talk uh, first a little bit about with assortment optimization and going to define our setup, which is actually the most basic setup that you can have in assortment. But um, all research activities start with understanding this problem first. And so I think it's very important that with this uh, work, we are actually able to understand one basic uh, problem almost fully, as you will see later on. I'm going to talk a little bit about the classical choice models, which is uh, the RUM models, random utility models. And then I will slowly walk you through to end up with the model that I will be focusing on today, which is the marginal exponential model. So marginal exponential model is a special case of what we call a semi-parametric choice model which also has a representative agent model representation. And this is the part that actually we, can, we will be seeing the relationship to the, the, the arrow. And uh, then I will define the assortment optimization problem under this particular choice model. And I will give you a bunch of theoretical results uh, related to the complexity of the problem and the special cases uh, that we can solve efficiently. And then we're going to finish with some numerical experiments. So when we uh, talk about product assortment, we are thinking about a very classical problem in revenue management where every retail who has a retailer who has a shop uh, faces. So you have a spec, you have a um, certain uh, products to sell and you need to choose which ones would be the most profitable if you were to store them in your store. So this is the classical retailer problem. But nowadays we can also think about a lot of applications. For example, in Netflix, if you look at the screen then the, there are obviously many alternative movies that can be offered for a person to view, but there is only like a limited uh, space and there are only five or six movies, for example, that are chosen as a recommendation for the uh, person. So you can think about this as well. This is like some sort of assortment problem as well. So our goal is to look at um, like, large set of available products and then choose a subset, an assortment from them to offer to the um, customers that will be coming to our system. So in particular, as I said, I'm looking at a very basic um, setup. We're going to have Q distinct products, which are substitutable. And uh, for each product, we're going to assign a utility and the deterministic component of this utility will be known to us, which we will denote by VI. And I will talk about how this, uh, there will be other components, uh, random components of this utility just a bit later. And we're gonna assume that we know the unit profit of each product and we're gonna denote it by PI. We're going to represent the um, sales that don't happen 
uh, or uh, to be the no buy options uh, to, with the index uh, zero. So this corresponds to the case that a customer comes in to the store or uh, whatever the like, um, uh, online platform, they look at the available assortment. And if they don't buy but leave the system, we're going to assume that they're buying product zero. And we're going to uh, mostly capture the competitor's uh, share by this product. And it's going to have its own utility and its own uh, property attributes as well. And as I said, our goal is to find a subset S out of the items uh, one to Q. And um, we're going to uh, say the probability that the customer chooses a product I to be XI of S. And the most important thing here is that the, this probability depends on the assortment on offer. And the, the expected profit uh, uh, to be earned by the firm is going to be the sum of the uh, profit times the uh, choice probabilities. And our goal is actually to, uh, to find a subset that maximizes this expected profit. So what is traditionally done in revenue management is that this uh, choice probability XIS is uh, modeled via discrete choice models. And the most common model that is used is multinomial logit model, which is a random utility model. I'm going to introduce you this model in detail and we're going to criticize it uh, so that we will motivate the type of discrete choice models that we are using, we have been developing. So in the random utility theory, each alternative is assumed to have a random utility, let's say UI tilde, and it has two additive components. The first one, VI, is known, uh, the deterministic component uh, denoted by VI. So this is anything that we observe. For example, if you are uh, looking at um, a washing machine, and uh, that would be the brand, the price, uh, the um, like echo level, uh, the like energy consumption level, and, and uh, stuff like that. And in addition, we are assuming that there is a random component that is there to model all unobserved uh, components. And this also involves the perception error of the users. So for example, if we think about the traffic context, you can look at a route, and then when you think about that utility of choosing that route, you actually have a lot of biases in your brain about how the loaded the traffic is there, how many like red lights, your previous experience on that road or similar roads. So that would introduce a perception error that we can't model easily. So this is the random component. So in traditional uh, uh, choice uh, theory, it is assumed that these uh, epsilon i, the random components, follow a given distribution, and the distribution is fully specified. And in many cases, uh, actually, these error terms are independent from each other. And uh, I may say that these models are very popular and used in marketing, psychology, even machine learning for clustering. So they have a lot of applications and they've been used for many years by uh, many uh, researchers from different communities. It's uh, very common uh, to assume that V0 is equal to zero. And this is without loss of generality because at the end of the day, when we are looking at the choice probability of one item, all we will care is how much better it is compared to others. So in particular, if it is the best among them. So we only care about the differences of the utilities. Therefore, setting one of the uh, deterministic components to zero doesn't affect the model. So in the choice model, we assume that each customer arrives and observes the uh, assortment and they have a realization of these random terms and then they choose the uh, alternative with the highest utility. That's why sometimes the RUM are actually referred as random utility maximization models. And with this actually the, the choice um, probability for item I has a rigorous definition, which is the probability of I having the highest utility under the given distribution. So every time that you specify the distribution theta, you get a different choice model. For example, you can assume this to be the Gauss, multivariate Gaussian. In that case, you assume that you have the knowledge for all the covariances as well for the covariance uh, as well, but uh, that is of course a lot of information to assume. Or you can assume something very simple, like in the multinomial logit model that the um, 
epsilon i terms are independent, they're identical, and they're gumbled with, an, uh, with parameters zero mu. And if you do this very simple assumption, it's very easy to work out by just basic calculus that the choice probabilities have this ratio, the closed form, uh, which is the ratio of something that is a function of the utility of the product we are looking over the sum of the function of the rest of them. So this is like a very nice property because this is closed form and because of this one, it's very easy to work numerically. You can work with very large number of alternatives and you can have applications in various domains. On the other hand, it has uh, some drawbacks that we will see. One very important um, advantage is that if you assume that the deterministic component is actually a linear, para linear parameter model, then you can write down the maximum likelihood estimation function problem, and it would be a convex optimization problem, which you can solve very easily using it for mm, very large scale problems as well. But as I said before, there is a very like important drawback here, which we call the independent of uh, irrelevant alternatives property. It is that if you look at the ratio of two alternatives, the uh, the ratio of the choice probabilities of two alternatives, then you would get this simple expression. And as you see here, we don't have the attributes of any of the other alternatives, which means that you know your uh, model actually is uh, only limited to uh, very like strict uh, behavioral assumptions and so it's, it's not uh, very realistic and uh, there there is a very well-known example which is the red bus blue bus but i actually add, uh, included another example here to show you that this property is really limiting which is uh, from a root choice uh, model so imagine that you're looking at uh, the um, behavior of uh, some traffic users and they are traveling from one to two. And imagine that you have this very simple graph and you have three uh, routes. One is a direct route from one to two and the other two are going via three. So if you were to look, uh, apply the MNL model to this, these three routes have the same deterministic length and MNL would give one over three probability to each route, but which is not very reasonable because we can see that the two bottom roots are highly correlated. And for example, if your T is very small, then the probability of choosing the blow roots should be very close to half. So researchers have uh, observed this problem and they have come up various variants of the MNL model by trying to uh, extend it in very ad hoc way. And uh, one of them would be, for example, using a nested model where you first uh, look at the probability of choosing the, the upper root and one of the two blow roots. And then once you know that you're choosing one of the two bottom roots, then you look at which one would be chosen. So this is one way of like uh, dealing with it, but what we're gonna see is that there are better ways. The other problem with the MNL model is that it assumes that the uh, error terms are identically distributed, which means that they have the same variance. So they're homoscedastic models, which is not a good uh, way to model behavior in a lot of um, content, in, in a lot of applications. For example, in traffic, if your alternatives are uh, some of the routes are through the highway and some of them are through the country. It's obvious that you know highway will have a lot less variability because you know the speed limit and uh, there are no traffic lights basically. While in the country road, anything can happen. You may see a flock of sheep, which happens a lot in the UK. So uh, it's obvious that we need to somehow model heteroscedasticity elasticity in our choice models. So there are two um, heteroscedastic choice models that had been used in the revenue management literature before. And uh, one of them is the heteroscedastic extreme value model by Bond. And uh, this one uh, assumes that the uh, error terms follow independent gumball distributions. So, and um, they are with non identical gumball parameters. So they are actually heteroscedastic model. This is a heteroscedastic model. But this doesn't have the IIA property that we have just discussed, but it also doesn't have a closed form expression. And it actually requires a simulation to evaluate the probabilities, which is not very easy to do if you would like to solve these problems for large scale examples. And uh, just a note, uh, this is a uh, RUM model because we know the distribution fully. Another RUM model that had been recently introduced and um, I think is getting some popularity is the heteroscedastic exponential choice model. 
And uh, in this case, the uh, epsilon j's are assumed to follow the negative of independent exponential distributions with non-identical parameters again. So it's an heteroscedastic model, and it also is not limited by IIA. So this model has a closed form solution, but it requires to the know the sequence of the deterministic uh, component, uh, deterministic components, which is not very easy to estimate uh, if you look at the maximum likelihood estimation. So um, as far as we know, assortment problem is not uh, studied under any of these heteroscedastic choice models. And we will study uh, assortment under a different heteroscedastic model, but these are our benchmarks and uh, that could be used alternatively. So I will look at the comparisons of our model uh, with respect to these two. So what I will now introduce is the choice model that we are interested in, and that belongs to the family of semi-parametric choice models. Again, we are going to assume that the utility of each alternative is random with two components, additive components. But in this case, we're not going to specify which distribution epsilon i's follow, but we're just going to give a possible set of distributions. And this is where the DRO connection comes in. So whenever you have um, uh, some information uh, from uh, related to the alternatives, then you can say, that uh, these uh, error terms follow this information. I don't know the full picture of the distribution, but I would like to fit a choice model that fits to this partial information. So that is what we are trying to do. Under this um, setup, we're going to define the choice probability for each alternative to a maximal distribution. So it will be the choice prob the probability of this alternative having the highest utility under distribution theta star, where theta star is the distribution that solves this uh, maximization problem given underneath. So it's, that's the best distribution, that's the distribution that maximizes the expected utility from the assortment that we are observing. So this is very interesting uh, because it, it actually opens a big door for us because of the fact that whenever you have a semi-parametric choice model like this, you also have a representative agent model that gives you an optimization problem to solve. And that's what I would like to introduce next. So in uh, 2007, uh, it was shown that uh, this, uh, for every semi-parametric model, for every set of distributions, capital theta that you give, there is a corresponding representative agent model, which actually is just an optimization problem that we will see. And this means that we can apply techniques from optimization. So let's see what is this uh, representative agent model that I'm talking about. So in choice um, models, as I said, we look from the perspective of the customers arriving, looking at the items and draw, like, drawing a, a realization from a random distribution and then making a choice. So this is one way of looking at this problem. Alternatively, under the REM philosophy, we will be thinking about one single individual who represents the group of customers who are arriving by itself. And this customer doesn't only get the uh, the item that he values the most, but he actually has this uh, taste for diversity. He has a preference for diversity. So he actually calculates a probability distribution, his likelihood to buy among the set of items on offer. And uh, so for example, uh, one easy way to understand is to look at the MNL model and the, uh, what is the corresponding representative aged model for this. So instead of going through the Gumbel distributions I have introduced, you could obtain the same ratio for the choice probabilities by solving this uh, optimization problem that I give here, which is uh, just looking at the deterministic utilities plus a term that is uh, that acts like an entropy or a like penalty function that we would see in convex in many convex optimization problems. If you and they solve this optimization problem over unit simplex, and you would get probabilities which totally match the MNL model. And this is not only specific to MNL, as I have advertised before, it actually goes much beyond that. In uh, 2002, Hofbar and Sandrom show that for any random utility model, for any distribution that you have, then there is actually a corresponding representative agent model, which means that there is this function 
uh, Wx, which if you know the function, then instead of thinking about the simulations to calculate the probability and so on and so forth, or closed forms, you can forget everything and can just live in the world of optimization, solve this optimization problem with this uh, entropy component and get your choice probabilities and do all the applications that you need. So it's usually not easy to find uh, the correct representation. And for very key models, uh, for example, for the multinomial probit model, we don't have an expression. On the other hand, for an interesting set of uh, distribution, uh, families of distributions, actually, we do have the corresponding representative agent models. So these are the ones that I have worked on personally, and I think they are like uh, quite natural. The first one is uh, we have seen the MNL model, of course, and uh, the second one I said MMP that we don't know. We only know its existence. But the third one is an interesting model, which is the marginal moment model. So in this case, the only information we have about the distribution of the epsilon. Would you like to ask a question, Eric? I can't hear You're you. You're on mute, uh, Eric. Sorry. Yeah, I apologize for interrupting you. I was just politely uh, raising my hand. I cannot hand hear you, sorry. No? Am I there? Yes, I hear I'll you. Try again. Hello? You hear me, Celine? Yes, OK. Thank okay. you. I don't know what happened to my computer. Yeah, I was on mute for a while, too. I apologize for interrupting. I was just uh, wanted to indicate there's a question from Sven Lafer in the chat since you were uh, mentioning you would take them uh, live. Maybe Go I can ahead. read it for you. You want me to read it? Yes, please. OK. Um, how do uh, multimodal uh, MNL traffic models related to deterministic traffic equilibrium models where each participant maximizes their utility? Yeah. How to do? Is one more realistic than the other? Maybe related to representative agent models. Okay. Yeah. So or He's yeah. familiar with our work, but uh, with uh, Kartik Natarajan and a couple of our postdocs, we have actually three or four papers related to traffic equilibrium in which uh, we uh, use the, some of these models to calculate the traffic equilibrium easily because we do have the representative agent model, which actually gives us a large scale optimization problem that calculates the equilibrium, traffic equilibrium directly. Is that uh, what? Uh, the question is about? Um, it's more that in, in traffic equilibrium, the way I know it, you have uh, different agents who have origin destination pairs yes. and they each optimize their own uh, way going through the system and you have some overall system quality that you want to optimize. So say toll road design or something like that. And, and you formulate these problems as bi-level optimization problems. So you have an upper level, a Stackelberg game, where you have a leader and a follower. And the followers are basically, your, it's like agents that are moving through the system and they're solving it, opt, uh, they're doing their own optimization. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds a little bit like your, your representative agent is not quite like that because you add this um, term to it, this entropy term that sort of gives you some kind of averaging. Here, it really is, uh, distributed agents, you have all the traffic uh, routes in a, in a sense through the city, all the traffic demands through the city and everybody optimizes their own uh, traffic pattern on the fly in a sense, uh, while you're solving an, an, a different optimization problem, a sort of design problem, for example, layout problem. I mean, you can still calculate a traffic equilibrium with the choice yeah. models that we have in hand. Because like you are assuming that the um, customers who are going to travel and between an OD pair are going to look at the options in front of them, and then they make a choice according to the choice model. So the traffic gets distributed uh, according to this model, and it gives you the total flow in every arc, which you calculate okay. for every road. And then it gives you this like nice equilibrium problem where you can calculate the system equilibrium under this choice model which we assume like every agent behaves uh, like according to their best. And yeah. if you want yeah. to affect it uh, as a system planner, then what you would do is to play with the deterministic components of the uh, you know, costs of the routes or arcs. Mm -hmm. And then you would see like 
if you can uh, you know change the equilibrium towards a pref like preferable one for you and yeah. actually this is a very like you know I think nice area of research uh, that one can continue. In our papers, we have all the like necessary like technical bits for this because we have okay. sensitivity analysis and everything. So you, you could just like take it from there and actually do what you have in mind with these models mm -hmm. as well. Thank you. Okay. It's a very nice question. Thanks. Any other questions before I continue? I don't see any more questions. Okay. Thank you. So. Um, as I was saying, that like, uh, we are interested in this family of choice models, uh, semi-parametric choice models, and uh, they come with these two phase representation. One is like how we define them through the set of distributions the errors can belong to. The other one is the corresponding uh, representative agent model, which gives us the optimization function. And I put uh, here some examples. So for example, if your marginals uh, are known with their mean and standard deviation, then you get the MMM model and you have this um, optimization function with this um, penalty function. And interestingly, here, this actually turns out to be a problem that you can solve by using bisection, because all you need to know is the one Lagrangian uh, multiplier, which I will talk in detail in the, next one, in the next slide. Similarly, there is the MDM model, the marginal distribution models that know the marginal distribution of epsilon i's, but do not have any information on their correlations. And this is the model that we will study. And there is the third model, which we know the mean and the covariance, but it's not a Gaussian model. We don't assume the anything further than this on their dependency structure. And for this one, we do have a, a convex optimization procedure to actually calculate the probabilities. So today I will be looking at the MDM model, the marginal distribution model. But before that, just very quickly, the advantages is that, so when we think about the semi-parametric approach, it gives us a way to interpret these models. If you look at REM, it gives us a way to use numerical optimization. And uh, we don't have uh, the closed form formulas like MNL, but we can actually use these um, models almost as efficiently as they are because we know their characterization through the optimization problem. Because they obey first order conditions, we have a lot of information about them. So we can use them in pricing and in equilibrium, just as I mentioned, in traffic equilibrium, we've been very successful with, by exploiting these models. And um, uh, we don't need to assume anything on the, their variance, independence structure. We can actually go much beyond than many of the choice models we've managed to go before, especially in traffic context. This is very important because we can model skewedness, multimodality, scale variance, and many other properties that we would like to have. We can also mix distributions. We don't need to stick to one family for them. And we have shown in other uh, studies that actually these models, the CMM model, is a very good approximation for the multinomial probit model and mixed log it as well. And today we're going to look at uh, more the, for the MN uh, bundle and its um, generalization. So what do I assume for the marginal distribution model? So here I will assume that uh, I know the CDF of the uh, utility of the error term epsilon j. I'm going to assume it to be strictly increasing and continuous. And I'm going to assume that it has either a, a finite or semi-finite domain. And these are important to define the optimization problem properly and have unique solutions. And uh, MDM will assume that uh, our capital theta is a set of distributions whose marginals are the given fj's. And this is the optimization problem that uh, we need to solve in order to calculate the choice probabilities. So this is a very nice uh, problem because if we just drop the non-negativity constraints and just add the Lagrange multiplier lambda and write down the first order conditions, then you get these uh, two equations. And by bisecting on lambda, as I mentioned before, we can solve this problem numerically very efficiently. And this is what we are going to be exploiting. So it makes no assumptions uh, on the correlations. It's a very natural extension of MNL, just like the two other RUM models that I have mentioned. And uh, there, there had been like a, a very successful applications of the MDM itself in traffic revenue management pricing product line optimization, because it is the simplest uh, in some sense, a semi-parametric model. But today I'm gonna go even simpler. So I'm going to actually work with marginal exponential model where we're going to say that the FJs, the CDFs, are exponential uh, distribution with parameter alpha j. 
And now we are looking at uh, this uh, marginal distribution model with these particular exponential marginals. If you, we do this and we look back to the optimization problem, solve for lambda and plug that back in for all the xj values, we actually have an expression for the xj, which is a function of x0. So interestingly, like we now have a problem that the choice probability of uh, product j can be expressed as a, in a form that is a function of x0. And then all we need to do is to find the correct x0 that makes the sum of the probabilities equal to one. This is again the, the bisection, but we got rid of lambda. We are only working with x0. And a, if you set uh, all of the alpha j's to be equal to each other, then we would get the MNL model. So it is very natural and natural extension, as I said before. Interestingly, it was an open question in literature whether this simple MEM model has an RUM representation or not. And recently we have shown that there is no distribution that would give this model back. So it is not an RUM model, but it is uh, like uh, in the family of uh, models that are beyond the RUM models which was an interesting technical result. And um, because we have done, shown this result, we also had to prove a lot of other properties related to this choice model, because many of the literature in choice models uh, are uh, working for REM models. They use the properties of them, but we had to come up with the equivalent results for the uh, model as well. So that was one of the contributions of our work to show that many of the properties, nice properties for REM models actually apply to MEM and in general to MDM models as well. So now I'm going to start talking about assortment. So when, how do we solve the assortment problem? We said that we would like to maximize the profit that is given in this expression. And our choice is the, the which assortment to choose. And uh, of course, when I, if I put all the bits uh, that I have just introduced all together, then I get this interesting uh, nonlinear program that uh, is the program that we need to solve. And of course, the first question is this, is this a hard problem or not? And that's the first uh, result that we have obtained. And this problem, the assortment problem under MEM, MEM is actually MP hard. And in order to show that, we actually looked at a very simple case where the, all the parameters of the marginal distributions for the actual products are identical to alpha, but the outside option alpha zero has a different um, parameter. And a, with a little bit of algebra, you can rewrite this problem as a problem one here, and then you can show uh, with a lot of effort that uh, the, the, you can show a reduction from the two partition problem, and it shows that this is MP hard. So. If tau is equal to one, the problem is equal to MNL, which is easy to solve. And later on, I will show you a result. If tau is less than one, it is also easy to solve because it's going to be one of the special cases that we know how to solve quite well. So that uh, brings me to the next question. So we have proved that this is an MP hard problem, but is it really hard? It's like knapsack. Knapsack is MP hard, but we know how to solve it very well. The answer here is actually similar because at the end there is a hidden knapsack structure in this problem that we were able to explore. So we're going to see that there is an easy to solve special case which actually has assumptions that are quite reasonable and the second we can develop a lot of different types of approximation algorithms for this problem. I don't think we have done everything yet ourselves but I'm going to show you two of them. So what is this simple structure? So in uh, revenue management, in assortment, uh, product assortment literature, there is this concept of uh, nested sets, which is very important. And there are a lot of papers that actually show for different choice models, assortment problems to be easy to solve because the optimal uh, solutions obey some sort of nested uh, property. And it, it will apply to this case as well. So we're going to define a set of products to be profit nested or revenue ordered if they have the property that everything that is not in the assortment has a worse uh, profit than the ones that are assorted. And we also have equivalent strictly nested uh, set which is given here in the definition, but I will just actually show you a simple example. So for example, imagine that we have five products and the profits are given as uh, here. Product one is the highest, two, three, four have the same profit and five is the lowest profit. Then the profit nested sets would be numerous and uh, some of them are listed here. 
But if you look at the strictly profit nested sets, then we only have three of them. And it is either uh, offer product one or one, two, three, four, because two, three, four have the same price. If one of them is included in a strictly nested set, all of them should be included. Or all the products, uh, if you assort all of the products, that's also a strictly profit nested set. So this definition is important because in some applications, you may have products with many, like many products with the same price. And if you say that the optimal solution has an asset property, it doesn't really give you too much because there is still almost exponential in many of them. But if you can prove a result that you know the optimal solution will have a strictly profit nested set, then you're looking at the most Q sets. And that's the result that we have. So we have proved that if the MEM problem has the property that the uh, marginal distribution parameter alpha zero for the outside market is less than or equal to the uh, parameters of the products, of all the other products, then there exists a strictly profit nested set that is optimal. So this is uh, like giving us a way to solve the problem if these um, assumptions hold. And we think that these assumptions are economically reasonable because uh, the, they say that the utility for the outside option has the highest variance, but this is reasonable because outside option corresponds to the customer going outside and buying from various different um, retailers. And of course you would expect variability in their utility. So that is a, a we think is a reasonable assumption. And um, so the proof uh, of this theorem is actually very interesting. It, uh, we started with a proof that was using just a very simple um, algebra and um, you know, just comparing different sets and we were able to prove a, uh, like like a little bit like a loose result compared to this, but then we managed to actually prove this result, which is actually the best that we can hope for using convexity and duality. I think the proof is actually very interesting. I don't have to, to, to talk about it, but if you're interested, you can take a look. So what happens if the conditions fail? So if the conditions fail and we cannot say that we can solve the problem by looking at nested sets, then we can do two things. One, if uh, it's important to approximate the problem uh, to a high uh, accuracy, then you, we can actually develop a one minus eta approximation scheme, which will be related to the DP approximations for knapsack problems. So uh, what we would we do here is I just gave a very simple representation here. We know that the outside market uh, will be a number between zero and one, and we're actually able to say even better we can have, write down an expression for the uh, lowest value that the uh, outside market can have and the highest value that can have. And then you can discretize this interval. And for every the interval uh, there, every point there, every possible value of y0, the outside market, you can write a corresponding knapsack problem with real parameters. Then you can uh, approximate this by using the DP uh, method for the knapsack problem with integer values. So there are two approximations that you need to do together, but at the end you can put them all together and you get a runtime polynomial in the number of items and one over eta, which um, is I think an, again, a very like, interesting way of I think uh, looking at this problem and exploiting the hidden sex structure. Or alternatively, you can also say, oh, like how about that profit nested approximation that you said that, you know, for the certain conditions, uh, looking at the strictly, um, profit nested sets was a good idea. So what happens if you do that, even when the conditions fail? It turns out that it is not a bad idea, actually. The, if you use the profit nested sets, you do get a reasonably good approximation. And you, we can prove the approximation guarantee using um, a result that is uh, from literature plus our own uh, contributions. So first of all, the first result uh, that is related to profit nested approximations is from Barbeglia and Joret, and uh, they prove that for any regular model, uh, the approximation guarantee would be the maximum of these three numbers. At that point, uh, nobody knew that these type of models that I'm talking about, MEM or MDM, are actual regular models. But today we know that we've proven that, as I mentioned before. So we know that this approximation bound applies to our algorithm as well. But in addition, we were able to introduce one more term here. So, and interestingly, if you look at these four terms, all of them can be active bounds. And we have numerical results that show that. And uh, here, the 
bounds is related to the number of items, the number of items with distinct profits. And then there is the last one, which is one over one plus log nu, where nu is actually related to the optimal assortment, which usually is not known. But in our case, by using the MEM model, we can actually in the, give an exact expression for that one, which I have written here. I think details are not important, but I think my main message is that by coming from this semi-parametric uh, you know, uh, approach, by having the optimization, equivalent optimization formulation, by being able to write down an expression for X0, even though we don't have the close form like MNL, we actually get a lot of results. And, uh, you know, we, uh, and they're all computable uh, as long as you know the attributes of your product. So from my point of view, I think this is a very nice way of you know, using the tools uh, of optimization to solve any related problem. So I'll just give a couple of experiments uh, to show like how we are faring uh, numerically. So if we compare the MEM model, the exponential marginal model to the exponential uh, heteroscedastic exponomial model, we, uh, we need to think about like uh, what type of uh, simulation that we need. So of course, ideally, we would like to make these comparisons by using real data. Within assortment, uh, it's very hard to find real data for various reasons. So we have decided to generate grant truth from different distributions, uh, for different distributions, and then estimate the uh, model parameters for MEMs, so all the alpha Js, and similarly for HEC. And we have recorded the log likelihood values and the um, square mean root mean square errors to see how good is the fit. And we looked at the optimal revenue that can be obtained from each model. So the four models are given in the columns. And uh, you will see that the ground tools in the first two cases are the two competitive models that we are trying to benchmark against. We also use independent normals and multivariate normal. And in some cases, we are the, in most of the cases, actually MEM is the better fit. But if you generate the um, ground truth from HEC, obviously HEC fits better. And we think this will be the case all the time. So the message here is that uh, our model is competitive to the existing RUM models in terms of fitting the data and also being able to give good uh, uh, assortments. And uh, we had a chance to try a little bit with empirical data and I don't have the results for the assortment here but I want what I want to show is how it fits. So this is a large data set from jd.com. I think that was a data set that was collected for a competition a couple of years back and it has millions of transactions. We like this data set because each transaction tells us for a customer which items they viewed and then uh, because uh, they are searching a website and they click on certain products, so that is the view set. And we consider this as the assortment. And then they either buy or they don't buy. So as I said, it's very hard to have assortment data sets. The data sets good for assortment problem, but this gives us a reasonable, uh, like I think, data set that we can assume to be appropriate. And uh, it was very large with um, many, many products. So we just uh, decided to look at the top eight products. Uh, and we found that there were 1,784 distinct customers that bought these eight products or looked at assortments with these eight products. And um, these are the attributes. So there are four attributes for each um, product. And if we fit uh, the MNL, the classical MNL model, our MEM model, the HEC model, and then the um, MEM and HEC models where we have identical parameters for all the items, but a free parameter for the outside market. So these are, as you can see, very easy models to estimate because you're estimating only two parameters. So in MNL, you estimate one parameter. In MEM and HCC, you estimate Q parameters. But in the last two, you estimate only two. So they're very parsimonious. And we can see that actually the last two perform quite well, uh, which again tells us that maybe our theoretical result uh, was not a bad one. The problem that we looked at uh, where we have assumed all the um, items that are on the assortment have a similar parameter, uh, have identical parameters can be quite realistic um, uh, to be used. So 
the other thing is like of course like we've been talking about the revenue uh, or profit nested optimal structure and we know that this structure uh, holds for mnl model as well and it you may ask that why do i care about mem do i really need to think about the mem model so the we're going, I'm going to show like that actually thinking about the exponential marginal distribution so going to the semi parametric world has some value so here we compare the um, profit assortment that are the product assortment that are obtained by assuming that the model is um, MEM versus MNL and then you calculate the best uh, assortment using the profit among the profit nested sets and then look at the profit and compare so we can see that uh, like 80 75 88 percent that bracket of the assortments are same but there is a significant amount of them that there is a difference. So you end up offering different assortments because you have used the correct model. And then you can see like you can have gain 35% more profit in some of the cases. So we think that this gives us enough, like all of these miracle studies, I'm only like showing you some of them, give us enough proof that there is value in the using heteroscedastic model. And there is value in using our model, the, the, the semi-parametric model, because computationally it is uh, giving us a lot of like um, tools to play with and uh, we hope that there will be more uh, people in the revenue management world that will be actually like using these models and um, maybe develop uh, similar uh, results as well so um, i think that's all i would like to share as i uh, said uh, so i introduced a new um, heteroscedastic elastic day choice model which is related to dro and uh, we've seen that assortment under this model is mp hard but I hope that we agree that it's not an actually hard problem because I showed you two ways of obtaining approximate solutions. I did not show the like, uh, more numerical sets, uh, results about like, but actually we have seen that profit nested approximation is on the average 95% optimal. So it's really like very good approximation. And then I just want to just finish with the message that, you know, these models are convenient, flexible, they're tractable in some sense, and they should be used in uh, numerous uh, applications. So um, the paper is in SSRN if you are interested in, and I do have some references that you can look at later on when I share my slides, and I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Selim. Uh, very interesting talk. Uh, are there any questions from our participants? Can either raise your hand or write in the chat if you don't wish to speak out loud. Fabien has a question. Yeah. First of all, uh, a first comment. Uh, thanks a lot for this talk. It was very interesting. Uh, I, I'm not too familiar with the marginal exponential uh, model, but it seems that uh, it has nice properties. Uh, so, uh, first of all, I would like to ask some you some general questions about uh, this kind of model. Uh, first, you, you said that uh, it can approximate quite well the mixed-grid model. And the mixed-grid models have been shown that they basically can approximate any um, random utility maximization model. So does it mean that in some way, the marginal exponential model could approximate any random utility model? I think there is potential, uh, but I think there is like some theoretical gaps to claim this formally. Because it's like so far we have observed computationally that, you know, we approximate this very well. But, uh, you know, saying something more formal is, uh, is hard. Yeah, but in the I same way. Uh, I will say that mixed rate models you have theoretical guarantees, but numerically speaking, they have issues to approximate some random utility models. So in practice, does it possible to, to have good approximation even if you are not exactly close to to the random utility model? Uh, I believe so. I mean, uh, so uh, I have not worked with mixed log it myself, but there are results. And uh, the, the idea is here is that, you know, if you look at the external distribution, then you're able to see that it's a mixture of different distributions. And then you can you know, use that information to like get a good approximation for them. So, but of course it is approximating a, like, you know, a particular uh, mixed model. So the question is like, 
if you knew the uh, mixed logit model, then would you be able to write down the correct MVM function right away? That requires a little bit of work. But we have observed like, you know, various like experiments that it happens. So, okay, and the, I, I have a personal experience with the uh, Probit model. So we know that if you put the same covariance matrix to CMM and Probit and look at it, under like certain circumstances, they almost give the identical result. But of course, there are some scenarios that they will not be as close. And we have a, like at least an an idea when when, when that happens. Mm -hmm. That's yes, something interesting. Uh, you, you show you, you have shown at the beginning the example of a uh, good choice in order to, to show the limitation of the IAA. And but the good choice modeling is still employing a lot of uh, multi analytic models because of the issues to, to apply other models. So does a, a someone try to, to use MEM for good choice modeling? I, we do have a paper in transportation science, mm -hmm. uh, two papers on transportation research. So they're both about like how to calculate the stochastic user equilibrium based on root uh, based models. One of them, we use the CMM model, the cross moment model where we have the covariance information. The other one is the marginal distribution model. And in the third paper in the tra uh, transportation science, we look at the Markovian uh, version where we look at the link choice and then have a you know cost to go function that we calculate uh, in order to find the equilibrium. So and in that paper we show that every MNL extension used in traffic literature can be generated by, as an MVM. So it's very interesting. Babel, uh, you know, if you're familiar with all these like you know uh, the extensions with pad logits, pad size logits, you know, uh -huh. all of these have a corresponding f function, an fj, with you know, usually two parameters. And when you like reset them up in a particular way, run through our model, you get exactly the same choice probabilities. So uh, MDM is like a very strong uh, in that sense because it captures all the MNL extensions that traffic community talked about. But I think it's because they were very ad hoc. So because you were, they were saying, oh, let's scale this variance, which corresponds to scaling your exponential <laughs> This and that. So we managed to match all of them. Uh, in, if you look at the paper, there is a list of capital Fs that match them. Yeah, we have a look. It, it is so interesting. Uh, yeah. Uh, and last question. Um, an extension of the uh, UM is the master logit. In the sense that uh, in the master logit, you can uh, introduce some attributes from other alternatives inside one alternatives in order to make uh, them not really independent, but dependent. Does uh, MEM uh, is is uh, the MEM approach able to mimic this uh, this model of it? Very interesting question. So uh, I don't know if you're familiar with GEVs, the generalized extreme value. Uh, model. Yeah, but uh, GEV is still a uh, RUM, so it's cro it's more general than the MNL, for instance, but it's not exactly a model of it. Yeah, it isn't, but I mean, but I was uh, trying to get it somewhere different. So, like, um, so there are two versions of MDM. Uh, one is the classical MDM, one is the generalized MDM, and the okay. difference between them is very similar to like a GEV model. So, in the classical setup, you cannot have epsilons depend on the deterministic components of other alternatives. Uh -huh. But in the generalized MDM, you can. But once you have that, then you have a harder problem. But you still have a bisection that you need to solve. But just like estimating and working with that model is a bit larger. But that model is more flexible. But the MEM model itself is not. So here we have a like setup where you know our uh, deterministic components are only related. The epsilon j's are only related to the deterministic component of the same. Actually, here there is no dependency. Like my epsilons uh, are just do not have a the distribution function of the epsilon doesn't have a v term in it so we're very very simple case does it answer your question or did i go somewhere? yeah it gives some answers yes uh, yeah that is so interesting uh, i will definitely have a look uh, on your papers thank you very much we can have a discussion later on as well if you want to connect i'll be happy to okay thank you actually it is really appreciated are there any que other questions from the audience? 
Yes, uh, Utsav raised his hand. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the nice presentation. Uh, actually, uh, I was wondering about uh, more about the uh, multinomial choice choice model. So, uh, in the multinomial logic, the criticism is that okay, the independent uh, like the independence of irrelevant alternatives doesn't hold. Do you think like with with more personalized assortment kind of uh, situations where I can construct like where where I assume that a customer has some choice set once it has determined her, his or her choice and uh, i know this choice set within which the customer is going to choose from and later within this choice set uh, i am only giving this this kind of choices so basically from a big set i am able to uh, like construct partitions and within these partitions i am allowing a customer to choose from so addition of any other alternative to this choice set would not impact a customer because once I know that the customer doesn't assign some probability of zero to this, mm -hmm. to these products, because this is what the customer features tell me. Do you think this, this assumption of irrelevant alternative would not be a big restriction? You actually asked an interesting question and I need to like tell a lot of things about choice models to answer this properly. So interestingly, all RUM models, if you like think about the slide I showed, are matching to the interior of the unit simplex, which means that a valid RUM model cannot have zero probabilities. And in my opinion, this is one of the biggest challenges and open questions in the choice modeling community. And I don't know why people are not working on this more extensively. There are a couple of researchers at MIT that are looking at this. So if you were to like make an assumption that this is my set, and if I introduce another item that cannot have any like you know substitutions towards it, then you're working in a very different realm. Because all choice models assume there is some sort of a substitution between the items. The other part is customization. Actually, this is a very hot research topic. Hussein Topalolu just gave a, a keynote uh, talk in a different conference on customized uh, assortment. And uh, it is a hard problem, but I think it is a very relevant problem. Because you know the Netflix example is actually a customized assortment, and you should look at the properties, attributes of the uh, person who are viewing, and the movie at the same time, and then person uh, personalize the uh, customize that assortment for everyone. So doing that for everybody is extremely hard, but you can choose an assortment from which you will have smaller sets to assort to someone. And uh, there they have made assumptions that this will have MNL uh, model. And then they actually have some very interesting approximation results related to this. And I think more papers will come on this customized assortment, which we are also planning to work on the next couple of years. Yeah. I, I also have a follow-up question. Uh, do you think that if, if I am like, suppose I, my all agents are like boundedly rational, they cannot compare between two, two more than two products at a time. I only look at like the feature space is so large that I cannot compare beyond two products. Uh, and, and do you think in those kind of situations, uh, the the MNL model uh, would be able to give a, a good description of the true truth? I actually have the same uh, question after Phoebe's talk yesterday. I think maybe you're also kind of thinking about this because of that, because this is like preference elicitation. And uh, I don't know, uh, but I'm also like planning to like learn about this. I have a feeling like maybe you also have that there is some work that can be done there and uh, yeah probably but uh, it's not an area that i have followed very carefully thank you. thank you thank you thank you uh we're slightly out of time unless there's another question that wishes to be voiced it would allow one last question but Great. So uh, I think we can close here. Uh, thank you again, Céline. Uh, I mean, any other con additional conversation could happen. And we, typically, I, I just go in a breakout room during the break to, to discuss with the speaker or uh, so you're all invited in room one. Uh, 